Justice Elena Kagan is a graduate of Princeton, Oxford, and Harvard. She clerked for Abner Mikva on the DC Circuit and for Justice Thurgood Marshall. After brief practice in Washington at Williams and Connolly, she entered the academy starting at the University of Chicago and ending up at Harvard. She served four years in the Clinton administration as associate counsel to the president and then as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. She was the transformative dean of Harvard Law School from 2003 to 2009 when she became Solicitor General of the United States. And one year later, President Obama nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. She is a gifted person who has been extraordinarily good in all of the very challenging positions that she has held. She also has a keen sense of humor, a deep insight into human nature and our institutions. Her lively and precise writing is a thing of beauty. Justice Kagan. Thank you so much, David. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be here at this great event. Um, uh, it's a real honor. Um, uh, thank you to Diane and thank your congratulations on taking over this wonderful institution, which has for so long played an important role in the development of American law. Um, but it's an honor because I get to introduce and to give this, I'm not sure this is a medal, but to give this medal to my great good friend, John Roberts. Now, I've looked at the list of past members, uh, past, uh, uh, you know, past recipients of the Friendly Met, uh, Medal, and it's kind of an unbelievable list. I mean, this is a list that you want to be on. But I I'm going to say that no one on that list belongs on that, this stage and uh, is a more fitting recipient of this medal than John Roberts is. And this is, of course, partly because John Roberts has a direct connection to Judge Friendly, one of the greatest judges of his era and probably the greatest judicial craftsman. The chief, as you all know, was a clerk for justice, but for judge, should have been justice friendly. Uh, and by all accounts, he was a highly valued clerk. I started looking this morning at David Dorson's biography of Judge Friendly and uh, started looking at the part where Dorson talks about Judge Friendly's relationships with his clerks. And one of the things that Dorson says is that Judge Friendly kind of had an internal ranking of clerks. So that as you passed through his chambers, it was like you're number 43. And suffice it to say that the Chief Justice was not number 43. I mean, from what you could gather from this book, it was sort of like, you know, there was Michael Boudin and Pierre Laval and John Roberts and Merrick Garland, and then there was just the riffraff. <laughs> but still, to be a Henry Friendly clerk, you know, even one who was as valued and as respected by Judge Friendly as John Roberts was. Uh, it was maybe deserving of a little combat pay. And so if it comes in the form of this medal, like who would complain? Here's how David Dorson's, this is David Dorson's first mention of John Roberts in the Judge Friendly biography. Dorson writes, many former clerks explained that others although rarely directly admitting it was themselves, were intimidated by Friendly. One clerk stated that the common denominator of all visits to Friendly's office was fear coupled with anxiety. Deadpan, Dorison says, deadpan, 
Chief Justice John G. Roberts gave a specific example of this phenomenon. After explaining that he was not among those intimidated by Friendly, he shared that one time, after Friendly buzzed him into his office, he complained that everything was darker than usual and that some of the lights must have been out. Roberts could not bring himself to tell the judge that he was still wearing his clip-on sunglasses. <laughs> he told friendly secretary after he left the office. Now, intimidated or not, John Roberts learned a lot from Henry Friendly. Or if not, then just by luck, John Roberts became a judge whom Henry Friendly would be deeply proud of and who in fact mirrors some of Henry Friendly's greatest qualities. So everybody who knew Henry Friendly spoke of his extraordinary analytic lawyerly mind. And the Chief Justice, I can tell you, has that same analytic quality, that same analytic power. His mind is deep and quick and incredibly precise. It cuts through glass. And it is very much a lawyer's mind, not one that's prone, say, to flights of fancy, but one that is grounded in and terrifically good at making sense of legal materials a friendly mind. So that's one part of it. Here's another. Henry Friendly was a great legal writer. Now it may be possible to be a great judge without being a great writer, but it sure is a lot harder. And neither Henry Friendly nor John Roberts had to worry about jumping that bar. I tell people all the time that the chief is incapable of writing a bad sentence. His writing has deep intelligence, crystal clarity, grace, humor, and understated style. So what I thought I would do this morning when I thought about these remarks was I thought maybe I would give you some sentences and ask you, is this Henry Friendly or is this John Roberts? So I went, I, I, I knew that, I know that there are a lot of uh, the chief's clerks here, and you know that at the end of every year, the clerks give the chief justice a photo, and that you always put on that photo kind of the line of the year, right? And so this morning, I went into the chief's office to look at those photos, because I thought I would get some good lines to give you and ask you to vote. But I decided it wasn't really going to work because here's what I found. When you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that that's even the Chiefs really, which I, I just wrote an opinion about that, you know? That... <laughs> or here's another one. Unfortunately, the canvas looks like one that Jackson Pollock got to first. That must have been before the chief became a modern art fan. <laughs> Tough as a $3 steak, as inexplicable as it is unexplained. Gives euphemism a bad name. What chumps? <laughs> well, maybe John Roberts doesn't really sound like Henry Friendly. I thought he sounded a little bit like that other Justice Kagan or something. <laughs> but then I realized that he was here first, so Kagan must sound like him. I don't mean to reduce the chief's opinion writing to a few funny lines. That's not representative of all the chief's writing is and all it can do. That writing is, in my humble opinion, the best writing in law. Now take the two things that I said and combine them. Felix Frankfurter once said of learned hand this, that there was a happy conjunction of thought and its expression, and that that conjunction resulted in enduring statements of legal principle. And that's what I always feel when I read the Chief Justice. He is a consummate legal craftsman. 
He writes intelligibly and powerfully about the most difficult issues in the law. He produces work of great insight and analytic strength and penetration and eloquence. Now, why is this important? Because let's be frank here, there's a lot that the chief and I don't agree on, except apparently about copyright. <laughs> Where we are two kindred souls, if lonely ones, But you know, on many other matters, there, are, there is sometimes that I really could tear my hair out about the things he thinks, and I'm sure he would say the exact same thing of me. And those things that we disagree about, they have consequence, they matter. They matter in our society, they matter in people's lives, and that shouldn't ever be forgotten. But still, the kind of judicial craftsmanship that John Roberts exemplifies and shares with Henry Friendly, his clarity, the intelligibility of his writing and his thought, his analytic precision, his ability to see and organize and make lucid whole areas of law, his ability to explain, not only to lawyers, but to a wider public, what his decisions are based on. Those qualities, they're more than craft. They're the foundation stones of the rule of law. One might say they're aspects of law's internal morality. They're an important part of what separates law from dictate. They enable law to provide a guide for future conduct. They make law something that can actually be followed by other judges and citizens. They offer transparency and accountability. They show how rules of decision are arrived at, and they show how to criticize them. And finally, those qualities of the master legal craftsman, they encourage, even if they don't guarantee, law that in its substance is careful and restrained and principled. And so I wanna close along those lines with something that John Roberts said about Henry Friendly, and he said this at his confirmation hearing. He said, Judge Friendly had such a total commitment to excellence in his craft at every stage of the process, just a total devotion to the rule of law and the confidence that if you worked hard enough, you'd come up with the right answers. And it was his devotion to the rule of law that he took most pleasure in. And one day, Chief, one day I'm confident that one of your clerks at his or her graduate confirmation hearing will say the same about you and it will be just as true. And it is why I am very proud to present you today with the Henry Friendly Medal. Well, I have nothing to add. Uh, <laughs> uh, Justice Kagan, uh, a deal's a deal, and I'm not gonna tell you what the deal is, but you shouldn't look for any Justice Kagan ERISA opinions for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, other than um, uh, a few comments uh, here and there, this is the first time uh, since pre-COVID uh, that I've uh, given remarks uh, of this uh, extent, certainly before an audience like this. And uh, when I sat down to sketch some of these remarks out, um, it occurred to me that I'd forgotten how to go about it. Um, but then I remembered, first thing you have to do is uh, begin with a joke. 
Uh, so with all these lawyers present, I thought I would tell a lawyer joke. But then I remembered uh, you shouldn't tell lawyer jokes because uh, the lawyers don't think they're funny and the non-lawyers don't think they're jokes. Um, <laughs> Uh, President Levy, Director Wood, members of the ALI, you cannot know uh, how meaningful this award is for me. Um, Judge Friendly's robe that he wore when he was on the Second Circuit hangs uh, in my closet in the robing room at the Supreme Court. Uh, on my desk, I have a bas relief of Judge Friendly's profile uh, executed by Elliot Goldfinger, who also did the sculpture of Judge Friendly that is in the Second Circuit main courtroom. It looks across to the sculpture of uh, Learned Hand. Yes, uh, he was the greatest judge of his era, but I think that sells him short. Uh, he was also, for example, one of the founding partners of a firm that was known as Cleary, Gottlieb, Friendly, and Cox. Um, he was at the same time the general counsel and vice president of Pan American Airlines when Pan Am was the dominant air carrier and also a significant uh, instrument in American foreign policy. He was a significant academic uh, in the law through his articles and uh, uh, addresses, uh, many of which are still worth reading today. He was very active uh, in a group called the American Law Institute and he did a number of other things like leading the campaign to raise money to build the first uh, uh, international law building uh, at Harvard Law School. He had an extraordinary impact uh, on the law. But his impact on me uh, was a more personal one. Uh, in 1979, when I came out of law school, uh, I was wondering if I had made the right choice uh, in shifting from history, which was my first love to the, the law, uh, because I thought the law school was a rather cynical place. I don't mean that to be singling out my law school. I think it was probably endemic. And I thought that the law was a rather cynical profession. Um, certainly a good place if you wanted a job uh, to make money, or a good place if you wanted to advance a particular objective and you could use the law to that end. But not um, uh, uh, an enterprise, a job, worth uh, being characterized as a noble uh, uh, calling. Um, and I did think that I had made a mistake, although I was glad that I was, was doing well enough. Um, and interestingly, Henry Friendly had made the same transition uh, when he graduated from Harvard uh, 100 years ago uh, in 1923. Um, when he came and announced to his parents after he was done with the Shaw Traveling Fellowship he was going to come back and pursue a PhD uh, in history. His mother, according to David Dorson's biography, um, uh, was horrified. Um, and she prevailed through various connections to have Felix Frankfurter talk to her, her son uh, and dissuade him from academia and encourage him to go into the law, which Frankfurter uh, succeeded um, in doing. Now, I had transitioned from history to law because I also had an inter interview with a particular individual. Uh, I, I was coming back to school uh, from home uh, and a cab from Logan Airport. Uh, and the cab driver uh, you know, asked me, said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a history major at, uh, at Harvard. And he said, well, what do you know? I was a history major at Harvard. <laughs> And that's when I decided I would give law a try. But uh, uh, coming uh, out of law school in 1979, I really did wonder if I had made uh, uh, the right call. Uh, and then a year with Henry Friendly uh, changed everything. I saw on a day-to-day -day basis, an eye-to-eye -eye basis, that a good and full life could be led uh, in the law. Yes, Judge Friendly was brilliant. Yes, he had a photographic memory, but it was his unrelenting hard work in the service of a passion for the right result, for the right reasons, that made him great and, at least to me, inspirational. His commitment was not limited to great cases. They extended to the most mundane. 
The friendly said of Learned Hand was true of himself to an even greater degree. Quote, he would make the tiniest glowworm illumine a whole field. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard the story that Justice Jackson tells of the three stonemasons. The older Justice Jackson, not our Justice Jackson, um, but it's about a passerby who comes upon these three stonemasons. They're working, they're doing the exact same thing. And he asks the first one, he says, well, what are you doing? And he says, I'm making a living. Okay. He asks the second one, what are you doing? He said, I'm arranging these blocks in a particular pattern that I've been instructed to follow. They came to the third one and said, well, what are you doing? And the person lifted his eyes to the heavens and said, I am building a cathedral. Judge Friendly, in his work, was always building a cathedral, no matter how significant or how insignificant. What Learned Hand said of his teachers, uh, Friendly said was true of Learned Hand. And this can surely be said of Friendly as well. In the universe of truth, they lived by the sword. That sounded to me like an exhilarating fight, and I wanted to be a part of it, and I still do. I am very honored to accept this medal, uh, not as an award, but as a continuing challenge. Now to the American Law Institute, congratulations on 100 years. 100 years ago, this building still housed the original tenant, the Pension Bureau, and I was fascinated to learn that they were administering pensions to 40 widows whose husbands had died in the War of 1812 in 1923. I didn't believe it, so I looked it up, and it's, it's, it's the case. Um, in 1923, Yankee Stadium was built, the first one opened. The Hollywood sign came out. Disney was incorporated, so our organization goes back a long way. Charles Evans Hughes once described the ALI as a, quote, roundup of intelligent discontent, end quote. That is still a good label, and I think we should be proud of it. Now, over the past hundred years, ALI has educated the profession, courts, and legislatures about what the law is and what it should be. And to the extent I can speak on behalf of courts in America, thank you very much for that significant contribution to the rule of law. And I wish you an equally successful second century. I am not sure what the friendly medal presentation will look like in 2123 but I suspect that artificial intelligence will be involved somehow. Now, Judge Friendly's stature in law is based on his opinions. I've looked at a bunch of them, and I've been helped in that enterprise by David Dorson's biography, and in particular, Judge Posner's uh, preface, which is worth, worth reading. Uh, Judge Friendly's opinions demonstrate, to me at least, three significant aspects of his craft. First, he had an open mind. Second, he had tremendous power of reason. And third, he had a pragmatic perspective, an open mind. Judge Friendly's colleague on the Second Circuit, Judge Feinberg, said that Friendly, quote, carried the full sweep of law in his mind. It was not limited by any predisposition. He wasn't pro-prosecution or pro-defendant. He wasn't liberal or conservative. You could ask his clerks. The liberals will say he was liberal, the conservatives that he was conservative. That wasn't a lexicon that he uh, operated in. His mind was not limited by any uh, being a disciple of any school of thought, it was not limited by any theory of legal philosophy. He was open to all arguments and would engage with all of them. Many of you, I'm sure, has experienced what is true of so many friendly opinions. When you get one, it's cause for joy because no matter how uh, uh, insignificant the issue is, the entire body of law will be spelled out for you. He delighted in fitting particular case in the context uh, of the law uh, as, as a whole. Um, second point, compelling reason. In his opinions, all of the steps are laid out. There's no hiding the ball. There is no sweeping the pieces off the check chessboard. This is what Judge Posner said about it. Quote, his analytic power, energy, speed, and work ethic made him the most powerful legal reasoner in American legal history. He applied reason, not ideology, analysis, not slogans, or mere case citations. Pragmatism, 
Again, Judge Posner, he tempered academic brilliance with massive common sense. The opinions for him were never, never a game. They did involve real people. The system had to work. They were not sterile. They told a real story. Now, as a general matter, those principles are good for judges, but they're also not bad for other officers as well. Yet much of the public discourse seems today very different. Instead of openness, most views being discussed seem to come prepackaged. Instead of reasoning, you get slogans and shouting. Instead of pragmatism, you get wacky theories that have no realm of being real in the possibility. Now, as a result, uh, truth, someone said, would be like a vintage sports car, too valuable to take out and use. Which leads me to one area where I part ways with the man that I am so proud to call a mentor. Judge Friendly was, I think, a pessimist at heart. He was, I know, very proud of his work. You could see it in his face when he was satisfied with the product. But if he were alive today, the contrast between his efforts and things going on outside this chamber would be de deeply disappointing to him and would feed certainly any depression. There's much in the legal arena that he would find abhorrent. A judge heckled and shouted down at a law school, protesters outside the homes of justices to the extent that martial protection is needed 24 seven. In 18 years, I asked well, what was the hardest thing, what was the hardest decision I had to make in 18 years? Was it this First Amendment case? Was it that death penalty case? Was it some major separation of powers case? None of those. The hardest decision I had to make was whether to erect fences and barricades around the Supreme Court. I had no choice but to go ahead and do it. But while it was going on, while the fences were going up, I kept hearing Charles Evans Hughes' remarks at the um, opening of the Supreme Court building. He said, the Republic endures, and this is the symbol of its faith. But inside the court, there's cause for optimism. I am happy that I can continue to say that there has never been a voice raised in anger in our conference room. Our court consists of nine appointees by four presidents. We deal with some of the most controversial issues before the country, yet we maintain collegial relations with each other. When I wander down the halls and see a colleague, I am always happy to have the chance to chat. Now, to be fair, there are many days where I don't feel like walking down the halls, um, so you may have to discount that a little bit. And on a final issue of concern inside the court, I want to assure people that I am committed to making certain that we as a court adhere to the highest standards of conduct. We are continuing to look at things we can do to give practical effect to that commitment. And I am confident there are ways to do that that are consistent with our status as an independent branch of government under the Constitution's separation of powers. Thank you very much for the Henry Friendly Medal. It means the world to me. Thank you.